Good day, everybody. This is Clara Bocchino based in South Africa and welcoming you to the second to last seminar of our series, um, which is today about work that has been done by the Sustainable Water Partnership in the Mara River Basin. And presenting today for us is Rodolfo Camacho, who is the chief of party for the Sustainable Water Program at um, Partnership at uh, Windrock International. He has a PhD and Master in Civil Engineer and Environmental Engineering. He's a day, an expert in water resources with more than 30 years of work in international development, currently based at Windrock, where he has the Sustainable Water Partnership, uh, which is a five-year project supports, supporting USAID, so the Agency for International Aid Development, through leadership, innovation, and action in global water security. Prior to Windrock, he was a vice president at ABT Associates, um, more than 20 years, and he led multiple projects funded by the USAID, the MCC, and other multilateral development banks in the areas of environment, water resource management, climate change, watershed management, flood control, and disaster risk reduction in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. So a wealth of experience here for you today, talking to us about the general aspects of the Sustainable Water Partnership and in relation to the data and uh, particularly of the experience that has been happening over the past couple of years in the Mara River Basin. Before I give the word to Rodolfo, I would just would like to thank you all for attending today, um, specifically today when it seems that the rest of the world is really in a different mode, uh, both professional and personal. Uh, so thank you for making the time for today. And as usual, we will welcome questions along the way. Just use the raise the hand tool or the question box for writing your questions and then I'll give you the word when we pause. Thank you very much everybody. Rodolfo, the floor is yours. Um, welcome to the series and um, take over from here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Clara. And, and good morning to all and I hope you are staying healthy and um, thank you for uh, being with us here today. And I know some of you are in the afternoon hours, some of them are early morning hours. Um, before I started, and uh, you can see the first slide, let me acknowledge uh, three of my colleagues who are attending this seminar. Um, we have Gordon Mumbo, you see it on the screen here on the on the first slide. He's our team leader for the Sustainable Water Partnership activity in the Mara River Basin in Kenya and Tanzania. Uh, we also have on the call Annette uh, Overly, who is uh, from the Stockholm Environmental Institute, and uh, Michael McLean, who is the who is in the Institute for Water Education, IHE Delft. Uh, so, and they will be also available, uh, I mean, to chime in or answer any of the questions. So, so, um, so today what we're gonna talk about, um, I'm just gonna be a, a brief introduction to the Sustainable Water Partnership, SWP, and the Mara Rear Basin activity uh, that we are uh, working on. Um, and then, then uh, uh, this this webinar is about data, and we're going to talk about uh, some of the data needs that are required for water allocation planning. We call it WAP in the Mara River Basin. This is a this is a, a work that has been going on for the last uh, couple of years, um, and how we address some of the uncertainty in water allocation planning. So those are kind of the three areas that we're going to be discussing today. Um, I'm going to be interrupting the the uh, at, at, at key points in the presentation, I'm going to stop and ask the questions because I don't want to go through the entire presentation uh, because there will be some slides that may require some um, some questions or on, on some comments. So, so I'll let stop and at uh, that time, and I'll, I'll let you uh, open for questions at that time uh, before we proceed. Uh, so, SWP is a five-year um, leader with Associates Cooperative Agreement with USAID, and it's implemented by Windrock International. And the overall goal here, as it stated, is to promote water security. And, and really, when we talk about water security, we're looking at availability, access, and safe use of water. And water security, we consider more of a broader term. We talk about water security for health, um, including water sanitation and hygiene. Uh, we talk about water security for productive economies, such as agriculture, energy, industry. Uh, we also want water security to maintain healthy ecosystems. And finally, we, it's, it's important uh, when we talk about water security, how we prepare for disasters from floods and, and droughts. Our SWP activities have kind of four different buckets. We provide mission support. 
uh, we have uh, field-based pilots. Uh, we also um, uh, work with partners and trying to leverage and uh, leverage partnerships for uh, sustainability. And a lot about about SWP is also uh, knowledge management, and uh, we put uh, total energy products there on on water security. Uh, and and share lessons learned from some of the field activities that we have. Um, current activities of WP uh, are uh, this is this uh, this seminar series is under the big data analytics and transboundary water collaboration for Southern Africa. It's an activity that um, has two year span. Um, we have field bay pilots, one in the sustainable water uh, for the Mara. Uh, this is the subject of today's presentation. Um, we also work in Cambodia, the Stanchinid watershed. And we have our associate awards in the uh, one in Nepal, the integrated water management activity. Uh, and uh, one in the Sahel, Burkina Faso and Niger, which is the water security and resilience in the Sahel. And that goes until 2024. Um, for the Mara, um, the sustainable water for the mud activity um, as that important goal of safeguarding adequate is susceptible quality of water for human well-being ecosystems, livelihoods, and socioeconomic development. It's a an overall water security activity. And we had kind of three buckets of activities, and today, of course, we're gonna concentrate on the water allocation planning and uh, for the MARA. Um, we also have on the ground water security interventions as well as institutional strengthening for improving water governance is an overall goal for this program. At, um, and we work at all levels, national level, regional, and also local level. So a little bit for those of you who are not familiar with the Mara River Basin, um, it's a transboundary watershed between Kenya and Tanzania. Um, and it into the Lake Victoria. Uh, it's about 14,000 square kilometers. 65% uh, of the water is in Kenya and 35 in Tanzania. Population is around 1.2 million. And uh, the land use is uh, there's a, a small percentage is the forest, um, mostly in the, this part, the northern part. And um, most of the uh, most of the land use is uh, rangeland, 70%, and, and the rest is a small scale agriculture. Key issues in the Mara River Basin, as, uh, as many waterways around the world have, is uh, increased deforestation and, of course, increased water demand uh, from all sectors. Population growth and expansion of agriculture is an issue. Um, uh, there is inadequate water demand management. Uh, of course, every, everybody, is, especially, is facing the climate variability and change these days. Um, we also have issues of water contamination, um, uh, access and to water and sanitation also needs to be improved, and the need for agricultural best management practices and alternative livelihoods are, are important in, in the Mara River Basin. Um, in today's presentation, we're going to focus on the lower Mara. This is the, the area in Tanzania. Um, again, it's like 35% of the entire watershed. Um, and and I, what I want to go over today in, the, in this presentation is discuss the uh, what we want, what we'll be addressing today is um, why do we need water allocation uh, uh, for the lower Mara Basin? And we want to go over the process to develop a web. Uh, what data is necessary for developing this WAP, how we address uncertainty for the water allocation planning. And, you know, from our experience, what has been this con the consideration for successful development and implementation of a WAP uh, in the Mara River Basin. So generally water allocation um, is necessary when you have water scarcity and, and and that combined with increased water demands and observed low flows during dry periods in the Mara River Basin led to really a, a, a transboundary agreement between Tanzania and uh, and, um, and Kenya, who signed a memorandum of understanding to manage the water resources jointly. And uh, 
uh, after that, this is one of the processes by which um, Tanzania and, and Kenya are um, developing their water allocation plans. Um, uh, hopefully, in the future, they'll, the, the idea is in the future to have a transboundary water allocation plan, but important also is to have the, the uh, uh, each country to have their own water allocation plan. Um, so a lot of the the challenges that are faced by Tanzania is that uh, there has been limited information on the availability of water resources uh, when issuing, issuing permits for water abstractions. Um, there is no much, there was no much information on the flows that need to be put in the reserve for basic human needs and sustain ecological functions. In Tanzania, uh, uh, one of their, their the guidelines have, uh, they pretty much have said that we have established that um, uh, a reserve flow, which is basically uh, water for basic human needs and, and also water for environmental flows that are important to sustain uh, in order to keep healthy the, the watershed. Um, there is, of course, unknown, there was an unknown of uh, the amount of abstractions and not knowing if there were some of the areas, some of the sub basins were uh, had, had permits with over allocations. So that was important to, to clarify. And also an important part of doing uh, the work for Tanzania is to enforce transboundary WAP discussions between Kenya and Tanzania once uh, this is completed. So the process um, that was followed in uh, in developing this this uh, WAP, uh, there was a an initial part was estimating the water balances by sub basin and and as you could see in this graph through the process, there has been always stakeholder engagement, input feedback and validation from all the stakeholders. Um, once you have uh, information on the water balances uh, by sub basin, uh, uh, there was a, a, a component of this is formula formulation of the scenarios because although we can see what's happening in the present, it's also important to understand what are scenarios, developing the scenarios, land use changes, demographics changes, ecological changes could happen in the future, and how that can be factored in the development of the WAP. Uh, and final, after having all uh, doing that exercise, there is a uh, uh, this drafting of the water allocation and approval and implementation. Um, the importance, of, uh, as I mentioned, the in Tanzania, uh, there was a strategic approach followed to develop the WAP. Uh, Important was to obtain the buy-in from the Ministry of Water, um, then conduct uh, a stakeholder mapping, which uh, uh, it was important to understand uh, all the stakeholders that uh, could provide input and could uh, be at every step of the development could be part of the review and input to the to the work process. Um, there was an inception workshop with all the stakeholders. Uh, the government of Tanzania also uh, developed the water allocation planning guidelines, which pretty much set the rules for how you calculate water structure, water balances, water demands uh, based on population, um, environmental flows, and what scenarios need to be modeled. So, so that was an important document. So, so the technical studies carry on the the WAP follows some of those guidelines that which were agreed by all the stakeholders. Um, then um, once the draft is uh, is put in, put out in the this validation of the with the stakeholders and uh, and uh, the, followed by final approval from the ministry and and then the dissemination implementation of the WAP. As we speak, um, the, the draft is almost uh, completed and uh, it will be submitted uh, by the end of this month for to the ministry for final approval. But the the final validation with the stakeholders was done. Uh, so. And 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 uh, which advice to move the process forward and and send the uh, the WAP for final approval by the Ministry of Water in Tanzania. So, as I as I mentioned, um, some of the guidelines um, that were established with regards to the principles. Uh, what are the priorities for allocation? Again, uh, 
domestic water use um, for basic human use and environmental research are kind of the uh, uh, are important amounts of water that needs to be put in the reserve under this WAP. Um, the guidelines included, the, as I mentioned before, quantification of the, the reserve and quantification of water availability for allocation, how you estimate water demand uh, depending upon the uh, population, population projections, the map by, by consumers and sector categories. So all those uh, were established in the guidelines. And of course, uh, finally, how uh, future scenarios on climate demographics, land use and infrastructure are uh, are, um, are set in order to see what could happen um, in terms of the uh, uh, future uh, uh, changes uh, that may affect uh, the water locations in uh, in the future. So, um, so, so one of the important part was uh, of this analysis was to estimate water balance. Uh, so basically. Um, if you have, if you could see, we have a total water resources here in this amount of water that we have in the Mara Rear Basin. So um, part of it is surface water, part of it is groundwater. Well, for the Mara, we don't have interbasin transfers, but but there is surface water and groundwater. And of course, if we set a reserve flow or down below this line is what we can set as a reserve. It was in the guidelines, it's not only the environmental flows, but also the the uh, uh, the flows for setting the reserve for basic human needs or domestic use. So those were flows that needed to set on a reserve below this line. And then the rest will be available for allocation to other sectors. And that's pretty much the principle of, of water allocation. You know, you have you set something in the reserve that you really need to maintain here, human uh, um, basic human needs and uh, environmental flows were set as as something that needed to be set in the reserve. And then after that, any other water could be allocated to other sectors, including uh, industry, agriculture, um, etc. Um, and, and so when we say water balance is pretty much the available water minus um, uh, the reserve plus transfers if there is six. In this case, in the matter, there are no transfer to other water chests, but the summation plus the summation of all available water locations. So that's kind of the way we, we, we estimate the water balance. Uh, so I'm going to pause here to, to see if there are any questions. Uh, at, the, at this point. Thank you, Rodolfo. Thank you very much for the initial presentation of the SWP and then the work that has been uh, done so far in Mara and the thinking behind it, which I think is very interesting because it brings together not just the classic water information that is required, but also how does water fit into a wider um, environment of users um, of both land and water resources. I don't see any um, hands raised for now, nor any questions uh, for sure. you at this moment. So, okay, so, I think, yeah. so I think you can continue and then we'll pick up at the, yeah. at the next break. Yeah, I, I got another, in a, in a few slides, I got another break after I go through a little bit more of detail on, on how we uh, uh, calculate certain uh, uh, elements for uh, the WAP. Um, so um, as I mentioned, you know, data data is important for water allocation. Uh, without data, it's, it'd be difficult to come up with a water allocation plan. Um, so we have uh, there were three or four four important studies uh, to carry out: one in water resources availability, water abstraction surveys. Uh, we also did a water demand analysis, and then an environmental flow assessment was also used for for the WAP. Um, data needs for WAP uh, on the water resources availability is the common information that we need for any um, water resources management in, in a basin. Uh, we need the topographic uh, data for delineation of basin and sub-basins, rear networks. We need to understand the land use, present land use, precipitation and other weather variables from meteorological stations is important. Real floor for hydrometric stations, hydrogeology and salt properties, uh, groundwater recharge interaction with surface waters, and 
of course, a lot of these water surface availabilities, what are the mean and mean monthly or annual river flows and and the flow duration estimates by river segments and 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 this is pretty much tells you uh, what's the what what amounts of flow is likely to I see for of different percentages and I will go over the flow duration but but these are basic basic information needed to uh, for water allocation understand what do we have on the river. Uh, so uh, water availability uh, was calculated uh, and um, by all suit basins, these are all the hydrologic units uh, in the rear, matter rear basin. Um, and, um, and I'm here talking about the entire matter rear basin. The, as you could see, the purple here is in the upper watersheds and so on. And, and this area is kind of the lower Mara going into Lake Victoria around here. Uh, Precipitation is higher on the upper part, uh, uh, average 1200 to 1300 millimeters per year. Um, and then, and then um, you see these are, you know, for the other watches, it's pretty much around the between 800 and 1000 millimeters. Um, as you could see to the right, the monthly averages from January to December, there is a, a peak uh, where it's kind of the, the wet season is around April and May. And there's a little bit of a second peak here in December, November, December, and and the other parts. Uh, now, when you get into May, June, July, it's more of the drier periods. And the 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 lower Mara Basin has uh, what's about in six hydrologic units uh, that you can see here. Um, one important thing of of uh, of water availability is to based on the data that you can find in all these watersheds is to uh, come up with the uh, average uh, flow available in the river at different probabilities. And uh, and this Q80, Q50, I'm gonna explain now with this curve, basically is, is, is for those of you who are not familiar with hydrology, um, flow duration curves are used to understand um, what percentage of the time I can see a, a flow. For example, if I say 80% Q80, that means that this amount of water here, I can see 80% is reliable 80% of the time. Of course, as the when you get floods, it's only seen like 10% of the time, you know. But but you wanna make you wanna on the, the Q80 is an important metric here for Tanzania as defined in the guidelines because that's what the all normal flow, which is something that I can see 80% of the time. Um, and 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 how that how that's uh, the peak in the water allocation is that, uh, as I mentioned before, and then for the for the Mara, uh, there were two different um, uh, uh, two different set of rules for in wet periods and dry periods. But as, um, if you see the graph here. The reserve flow, as I mentioned to you, is uh, the flow that is um, set on the reserve for environmental uh, considerations, plus the flow set on reserve for basic human needs. So anything in uh, here, the Q80 is, is the flow that I see 80%. So anything on this uh, pink uh, area, oops, sorry is what I can allocate to other uses aside from environmental flows and basic human needs. So this water is available for allocation. Of course, in the dry periods, um, um, the, the, the water available for allocations is, is less. Um, uh, flows above Q80 that you could see uh, less, less percentage of the time, there are flood flows. They also are available, but they are less reliable because they are only available a smaller percentage of the time. So with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna take another break here to see if there's any question with these two, uh, these three, three aspects here. Anybody has a question here? Thank you, Rodolfo. Yes, there is a question from Eva Newton. We've been following all of our. Um, all of our sessions. So, Evanilton, I'm going to unmute you so you can ask your question directly to Rodolfo. Here we go. 
Hi. <coughs> Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Evan Hilton. Um, I think uh, uh, Ciara has been uh, seeing me around for some time. I am from Angola. I am I work, I'm a professor at uh, Higher Education Institute here in Lubangu. And I've been um, uh, following these webinars due to their importance in our region since we're uh, being um, affected greatly by climate change and water availability as well. So you were uh, talking about um, Hello, I lost you. Uh. Hello, Anilton. I'm going to, sorry. Evan Hilton, can you hear us? Yes, yes, I can hear you. I think you could not hear me for a while. Yeah, can you yeah, hear me no, now? Just, yeah, yeah, you're, you were about to ask a question. Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, yes. As I was saying, uh, you were talking about different types of flows. You have the reserve flow, the normal flow, and the flood flow. And I, I didn't quite didn't get it about the reserve flow that you were talking about. You said it is basically the environmental flow that has to be kept for environmental purposes. And at the same time, you say that's the one that is available for our location. I, I didn't no. quite get that. No, that's not available for our location. Um, so both the um, a flow, uh, a flow has set, set aside for basic human needs. And I think that's about 25 liters to 30 liters per uh, per person per day. And those were set mm -hmm. in the reserve flow, not available for allocation. Only uh, the normal flow uh, that, and that you see in that graph is available for allocation. Ah, okay. Only the, the normal flow. And the reserve yeah, yeah, yeah. flow has to be kept uh, in Correct. the basin at any costs, right? That's right. That's right. Okay, right. So thank you very much. That was all that I uh, didn't get. Yeah, and, and in those <laughs> cases, when when there are situations where, uh, and we, I'm going to show you later, there might be situations where a water balance shows that uh, we're in the reserve is when uh, some permit uh, restrictions to be issued or order, or order, uh, water demand management uh, programs to be. Uh, put in place along with permit uh, restrictions in order to make sure that the reserve flow is kept. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 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 Thank you but very much. No, I don't see anybody else. Oh, yes, no, there is. Uh, Muhammad has a raised hand. Muhammad, I'm going to unmute you so you can ask your question directly. You're welcome, Muhammad. Well, Matt, can you, if you can't speak, maybe you can type the question in the question box and then I will ask it for you to Rodolfo. Because I've unmuted you, but it doesn't seem like you can be audible. Okay, I think Mohamed will have to type the question in the question box, Rodolfo. Sorry about that. It, uh, okay. it is unmuted, but it doesn't look like you can. It looks like it's self-muted, actually. I don't know if that's because it doesn't have a microphone or whatever the case may be. So we'll wait uh, for the Hello, good afternoon. Hello, can how are you? Can hear me? Yes, oh, we can. Sorry, I, I actually muted the, the microphone from my side. Sorry about that. No, you're welcome. Go ahead. Okay. So my name is Muhammad. I'm a research professional at Islamic Development Bank in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. And I've been following this webinar series, very interesting, very relevant for water professionals. Thank you very much. So in order not to waste too much of your time, I want to ask about this same slide, the flow threshold. What are the benchmarks? What are the standards? And is it common to all regions? The regions, we have the semi-arid regions and other regions around the world. So is this peculiar to the Mara Basin or is applicable? Is it a general case for every other basin? Um, Will it be applicable me, in other basins? Yeah. yeah, let me, let me, I mean, the, the environmental floors were set uh, because that's kind of the important thing that I uh, discussed here. Uh, 
are the they were very specifically by a study done uh, on environmental flows um, and I'm, I'm gonna, I was going to discuss that uh, in a few slices uh, and a few slides later uh, basically looking at water quality assessment geomorphology fish habitats uh, micro in, in, in invertebrates riparian vegetation so and based on all those studies that on the Mara they were used, they were they established the reserve flow now the I understand and maybe others can chime in here, but for basic human needs, um, those those are pretty much standards, uh, human standards in terms of uh, the amount of water that is required for basic human needs. And I think it's set at 25 liters per per uh, per, per day. Um, uh, that's the basic. That doesn't mean that uh, that's the minimum. Uh, obviously, domestic uh, water uses uh, uses more than 25 liters, but that's the minimum that should be always set aside. And I think in the Mara um, end up being the, like 30, uh, they end up with 30. But those, I mean, that's that, that, that's what I can say about the standards in terms of environmental flows, very specific to the Mara, um, because you know it, it, it depends on the uh, river system, the ecology there. Um, but in terms of uh, um the uh, basic human needs flows in the reserve those are pretty much uh, an international standard thank you very much for that clarification i think that's all i have for now yeah. thank you thank you both um i don't see oh there is another question from samuel so i'm going to uh Muhammad, i'm going to uh mute you and give the word to samuel for another question, raise hands. Samuel, can you hear us and can you speak? Yes, I got a question. I mean, I am looking at the flow thresholds, you know, for the wet season and the dry season. Can he elaborate on the flood flow, especially in the dry season? And also, what can actually be done in terms of uh, uh, reservoir construction and then be able to capture the uh, flood flow during the wet season. Which flow? I'm sorry, which flow in the wet season? There is a graph which you, you yeah. have on the flow thresholds, where you have got the reserve flow, normal flow, and flood flows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have got that for the wet season and also for the dry season. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So, so, yeah. So, so basically, and um, and um, um, uh, basically, there are two because um, in terms of um, uh, in the dry season, it's understandable that um, uh, there is always less water. But also, in terms of the reserve flow, for basic human needs, it doesn't change. But for environmental flow, it changes because uh naturally the, the ecology and the and the the vegetation everything behaves differently in the dry season so they don't need as much flow uh so the, so that's what you have a difference uh, that said uh, basic human needs flows always will be the same and, and of course because of the lower uh lower available uh, you know you got you got the q80 is, is lower why because in the dry season you see in order your 80, the flow that you see 80% of the time is gonna be smaller than in the wet season. And then of course you have to restrict, uh, uh, you define this as the normal flow that you can only allocate. So there's, go there's gonna be less flow to allocate in, in the dry season. Uh, and then that's, that's what, uh, and permits has to be also uh, take into account uh, that condition uh, during that period of time. No, no, I hear you, but the issue is on the reserve flow. Because if you look at the reserve flow, because that has to be like constant, because you have it to reserve it for the environment. And then why then do you have to reduce uh, the, the amount allocated for the reserve flow yeah. during the dry period? Because yeah. the environment is the environment yeah. it requires that uh, amount. Let me let me give you my explanation, but I will also ask uh, if if Michael uh, Michael can explain that. But the reason is that uh, the systems, you know, the you know there is a dry season, a wet season everywhere, and the uh, the environment adjusts to the dry a dry season, and therefore the requirements are, are different. Uh, 
because the vegetations and so on they adjust themselves to to the new to the new conditions of dryness and that happens every year and therefore for that was deemed that uh in the dry season the environmental flow requirements are smaller um that said again part of that reserve flow is the basic human need which doesn't change and and i don't know if if, if, if michael uh, mclean wants to say something about it he's on the on the phone too um yes if, if thank you Rodolfo. Can, yeah go I'm, ahead. I'm here can everyone hear me all right yeah good yeah. well good afternoon good morning everyone in uh Samuel and Mohammed, thank you very much for your questions. I've been listening with interest. And let me just say very quickly on Mohammed's question about the standards that we use. In this case, the country of Tanzania does have guidelines for setting or developing water allocation plans that call for quantifying these different types of flow, the reserve flow, normal flow, and flood flow. My goodness, apologies for any unintended sounds that are coming through. I'm working from home like we all are now. So outside my house, there's all kinds of things happening. But so we applied the guidelines that exist, but those guidelines are based on, on common and best practice around the world because, of course, water authorities always wish to make their allocations using reliable flows. They want to have confidence that the water that they allocate to users will be available to users. And therefore, the priority for allocation is generally in those, those, those more reliable and therefore lower flows. And flood flows are unreliable as uh, Samuel, I think, was referring to, you know, that's that's an opportunity for water users to put water aside to store water for those drier periods. And so, therefore, in the allocation system, the that flood flow is allocated especially to the big water users, like agriculture, with the expectation that they will they will take water during those higher floods. And when the flow drops below Q80. There, in the case of Kenya and Tanzania, they're asked to stop abstracting water from the river and to turn to their stored water to carry them through those lower flow periods until the water levels rise and they can then go back to pumping water from the rivers. Now, uh, quickly on Samuel's question about the reserve and why it changes. When we quantify the reserve and especially the ecological component of it, we actually make a recommendation for every month of the year, a variable flow, because it, as Rodolfo was referring to, the ecology of the river is adapted to the natural seasonality variability of flow. And so we capture that in our recommendations. But from the point of allocation, it's, it's unrealistic to allocate water and change the allocation every single month. So that's why on, under the guidelines of, of Tanzania and Kenya, we're asked to just distinguish between conditions of, of wetter conditions and drier conditions. And you guys were using the, the word season and it is a seasonal uh, phenomenon, but we're referring just to conditions here so that we don't lock ourselves into any particular schedule that's, that's attached to the months of the year. Because as the, the first, uh, uh, person asking questions, I'm sorry I've forgotten his name, pointed out in a, in a world with changing climate, the, the, the exact onset and conclusion and where the concentrated periods are of particular seasons is, is changing around the world. So we focus on the conditions rather than uh, a season that might be attached to, to particular months. I bet Paul's there. I've, I've been involved in great detail in this, in this work, so I, I tend to go on, but I'm happy to answer any other questions and support yeah. Rodolfo going further. Yeah, and thank you, Michael, and that's what I acknowledge. Uh, his friends, he's definitely uh, been on top of this, uh, of this, uh, this work, and, and therefore it's good to have him here, and thanks for clarifying and, and uh, making a, um, a, a couple interesting points there. Okay, okay. thank you very much for that. Thank okay, you. Let's, let's go forward. You um, nobody else yet. So, um, yeah, so, so another important thing was um, uh, the water abstraction surveys that were carried out in the 
in the Mara, lower Mara Rear Basin uh, to understand uh, what abstractions are being done. I mean, I think it's important to agencies, what agencies to have a good databases on this, but an, an abstraction survey was carried out to find out uh, what abstraction springs, uh, rainwater harvesting, dog wells, water pans, boreholes, etc. And then we we uh, we have a, a good knowledge now of uh, of what's going on in the lower Mara Bay uh, Basin in terms of abstractions. Um, and then um, water demand analysis was also uh, requires data on population by districts, basins, uh, livestock population, small scale irrigation demands, large scale irrigation demands, tourism water demands, wildlife water demands by species. Uh, those those were um, uh, uh, were estimated based on those numbers, uh, and of course then with that uh, we have a uh, the water demands by all types of uh, of, of of sectors and uh, and species and population etc. Uh, in each sub basin, and those were important of course to calculate uh, water balance. Uh, this is a slide that shows. Uh, the water abstraction survey where, uh, as you can see, there are uh, different points throughout the watershed on domestic hotels, irrigation, livestock, uh, mining, and other uses uh, were identified on this survey. Um, and, uh, and the water demand, and this is just an example of what's the projected water demand for domestic use by the six uh, sub watersheds that we have in the lower Mara, and uh, just nothing specific to to, to take from here is just that imagine for every for every type of use uh, there was an estimate of the uh, water demand in cubic meters per day, uh, and there were there were projections into uh, a few years from uh, 2018 2018 to 2023 uh, up to 2038, uh, based on demographic changes and estimates of changes in the in the watershed. Um, as, as we discussed earlier, uh, environmental flood assessment uh, was an important component of this project uh, in terms of understanding where are the rear floors, where are the ecology, where are the water quality issues, uh, fish habitats, uh, uh, repairing vegetation. Um, and, and with that, you can determine what type of uh, river depths are, uh, you need for both dry and uh, wet periods by subbasing that, as Michael does. Uh, Specify, um, and this is an example. This is a uh, this is a study that was carried out on the lower Mara environmental flow assessment, uh, and um, the point from there, uh, the flows for now, the flows were not vary over time. The requirements. Uh, this is an example for the Serengeti, one of the water sub uh where um, for the wet period and dry period, you have uh, um, amounts of uh, cubic meters per day that need to be uh, set on the reserve uh, for environmental uh, flows. So in terms of water balance, um, um, uh, water balance is, uh, is, this is a table that shows the water balance for the six watersheds. And um, again, um, what you see some red numbers, that means that um, those uh, uh, the water balance for normal flow, uh, which is available 80% of the time, is negative in those places, and which means that the demand exceeds the supply. Uh, so uh, at this at this time, it's important to establish some uh, uh, conditions. Uh, uh, so uh, so you have. Uh, a balance that is uh, is positive, you know. So, so again, you know, if we see the 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 water that could be allocated is the available water minus the one in the reserve, and and those negative numbers uh, pretty much tells you that um, the water should, uh, the 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 sub basin will be on the reserve, and um, something needs to uh, the 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 water board who will manage the permits needs to understand that and how they can. Um, look at uh, these potential deficits and and how can they manage that uh, uh, going forward. Um, I'm going to take a break here. If anybody has a question on this.
Thank you, Rodolfo. It doesn't look like there is any questions at the moment. Um, just for your own knowledge, Michael will have to leave in about 15 minutes. Um, okay. Because he has That's another fine. meeting. Uh, no, there are no raised hands Ooh. and no. Oh, no. Wait, there's two. Um, I'm going to give the first question to Kevin, uh, who hasn't spoken yet. Kevin is from the University of Western Cape. Uh, I'm going to mute you now, Kevin. There you go. Can you speak? Please yeah, speak. Can, you, can, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Okay. Um, um, two questions, basically. One relates to, to, to groundwater contribution to base flow. To what extent was that, that taken into account in, in, in determination of the flows, specifically the environmental flows? And then the issue of water quality, how does that e affect the, the, the environmental flows? Is that an issue between wet and dry seasons? So in terms of one of the one of the important things that um, as, as, as the WAP was developed as, is uh, uh, there's still uh, uh, a lack of understanding a little bit of what's the uh, available groundwater um, that that, uh, that that in the, in the monitor basin basing that's something that um, uh, uh, we're working on recommendations to the governments to to understand that better that said you know as, as you have uh, river flows uh, downstream um, you got some of the already uh, if you have extraction from groundwater or interaction from source of subsurface uh, water to 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 surface water uh, that would show up in in in, in uh, downstream in, in the rivers in the river flows because those some of those uh, return to uh, back to the river. So so in there is they are somehow accounted for. The problem in, that we have is that um, uh, we don't know how much uh, is coming really from uh, from groundwater, how much from the subsurface flows, and that's something that uh, um, the, the this after this uh, what is recommending. Uh, to to focus in understanding a little bit more that uh, those uh, uh, the interaction between groundwater and surface water. Um, in terms of water quality, well, water quality is always uh, a concern, but um, it, it doesn't um, at this time um, um, have anything. We it wasn't differentiated in terms of uh, the the what we call the reserve flow for environmental. Uh, Flows and basic human needs. Um, uh, it's is uh, there was no no determination in terms of whether or not that should be less or, or more because of water quality. That said, everybody understands that any any water withdrawals for 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 drinking water has to have a water quality uh, that is acceptable and uh, it has to be treated in the case that it's not acceptable. So. But in terms of the amount of the, the volume, uh, there was no 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 change uh, because of water quality. Thank you, Rodolfo. Kevin, does that answer your question? No, no, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to mute you again and give the word to Samuel for another question. Samuel, you are muted. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Essentially, I had two questions. One was uh, concerning the water quality. I think uh, Dr. Peterson has actually asked that one because it was I wanted to establish how that was actually uh, incorporated in the modeling of uh, of, of the best flows. And then uh, the other one is to do with the areas where there's deficits. Just out of interest, I wanted to find out, like in 2018, uh, how that was actually handled because uh, it's, it's being kept on, uh, you know, projected. But then the, the issue is what has actually been done as of now with regards to de uh, the deficit in uh, Tobora, uh, Somoche, and the uh, Gita. Yeah. So, so that's you know, as this, as this. Um, thank you for the question. But at this. Um, as the WAP is developed, this is something that um, uh, the government of Tanzania, along with the uh, water resources uh, uh, basin board, who manage the the abstractions and so on, needs to take into consideration in terms of 
of, uh, of how how could handle that in terms of uh, uh, re reserve if it, if it needs to uh, store more water or or what sort of uh, permit changes needs to be done based on that situation. Um, uh, so that's something that it will have to be managed. And and I'm going to let Michael before he leaves if he if he can you know uh, chime in on those because uh, I'm sure that question has come uh, quite a bit in in the stakeholders uh, consultation about those uh, basins that show negative uh, uh, balance, but basically it's something that needs to be managed. And, but maybe Michael, do you wanna uh, chime in here on what type of questions are, are you getting with regards to that and, and what is the government saying about that? Yes, thank you, Rodolfo. Let, let me say a quick word about water quality because that's a, it, it's an incredibly important point as, as Rodolfo and others have been pointing out. And on our reserve assessment team, there was a water quality expert and her role was to, to be sure that in setting the reserve, we did not set the reserve so low as the the alteration of flow would cause or enhance water quality problems, you know, raise them above an acceptable level. So in, in a reserve assessment, we do consider the impacts of flow alteration on water quality, but we don't consider it from the point of view of, is there enough water in the river to dilute contaminants that are being discharged into the river? In the water management system, Contaminant discharges are supposed to be managed through pollution prevention measures and the like. There's a whole set of other regulations to tackle those water quality issues. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure that we didn't uh, introduce the pressure that reduced water quality simply by altering the flow regime. So that's the way in which uh, water quality was incorporated. and. Uh, and the recommendations that have been made are recommendations that are considered high enough that the flow alteration does not alter water quality. And then, yeah, this question about the negative water balances in Tobora and Samochin, in this instant, you know, what these red numbers really mean is that in terms of normal flow, so that flow that's available 80% of the time that water was actually consumed by the reserve, right? So the, this is water that needs to remain in the system for uh, ecosystem vitality and also to meet basic human needs. So there is water available for allocation, but it's available at a, in a less reliable way. And so that's why the recommendations that come along with how this WAP is to be implemented uh, recommends that users that need reliable water turn to other sources like rainwater harvesting, whether it's rooftop or, or runoff, uh, also tapping groundwater reserves because of course the domestic demand is, is quite small on groundwater and looking at other alternative forms of storage. So just as, as Rodolfo mentioned, it's up to the the communities themselves and the water authorities to design and implement the measures that will enable the, the system to cope with these negative balances so that needs can be met while at the same time protecting that reserve. I'll stop there. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah, um, thank you. Very yeah. Good. And I wonder since Michael needs to leave, any other question for Michael on the water location? Because we are going to go into another area which is more of the uh, uh, modeling to the future in terms of uh, uh, different scenarios. Um, but is there any other question on allocation to Michael? I can answer too, but Michael is, let's take advantage of Michael that is here next 10 minutes. Not for now, okay. it seems. All right, okay. thank you all. Thank, thank, thank you, Michael. A pleasure. Thanks. Okay, now we're going to uh, move into future scenario considerations. Um, so, so one important thing of, uh, you know, we, we can put together a water allocation plan for today, the present, but we also need to know what's gonna happen in the future, you know, as uh, we think that this water allocation program probably will be there once it's, it's approved for the next five years, but I think it might need to be updated if situation changes. At the same time, 
we need to figure out uh, what ha what's going to happen in the future. And uh, for that, um, we work with the uh, the WIT model, which is uh, developed by the Stockholm Environmental Institute, and uh, to to work on those some of those scenarios into the future. Um, and and um, and this came out of a uh, uh, this is what we call uh, uh, we address this through uh, decision uh, support uh, robust decision support uh, systems, and basically. Uh, what we mean by robust decision making is, is pretty much an analytical framework developed by the RAN Corporation that look into identifying robust strategies and evaluate trade-offs. So when you have a lot of unknowns, as, the, as, as you gave away from 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, uh, the world becomes more uncertain. Uh, what's going to happen to land use, what's going to happen to economic development, what's going to happen to um, to population, what's going to happen to wildlife, etc. So those are kind of scenarios definitely that you need to consider into the future and what and more important climate too. So 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 in order to understand that um, uh, SWP with SEI facilitate workshops uh, in uh, in Tanzania to talk to the stakeholders and understand um, these uh, scenarios into the future. And for that, they apply what they call the XLRM problem formulation framework, which look at uh, uncertainties that are outside the control decision makers. That's the X. What are the management actions that can be taken in order to, to improve those outcomes? Uh, and what type of models uh, do we, do we use to understand those relationships? Uh, um, and also, how we measure those? Sorry, somebody is on, uh, Clara, somebody is on, on mute. Well, that's what I thought. So I'm checking the attendees, but it doesn't seem like anybody is. Okay, something is happening. Anyway, so, um, so for Tanzania, uh, the group determined that uh, some of the uncertainties that they were concerned uh, were about climate change and variability, land use changes, ecological changes, and upstream development. Remember, Tanzania is downstream of Kenya. So obviously in a water location plan, um, they, they, they're concerned that, you know, what happened in upstream could affect uh, the water in, the, in Tanzania. And, and they, of course, went through a list of different uh, management strategies that they could impose uh, uh, from, you know, uh, communications, water efficiency, water demand management. Um, uh, uh, one important thing that they consider is that hopefully having Tanzania a water location plan, then, then they can work with Kenya to develop a water for the entire basin, which is the next step. Um, and and uh, and of course, for in order to assess uh, uh, to, to to look at these multiple scenarios, both in climate, land use, demographics, um, uh, the WIP model was uh, used. This is the water evaluation and planning uh, model uh, developed by SEI. Um, so so to sum up, just the main four uncertainties that uh, Tanzania stakeholders identify were climate change, land use change, potential ecological changes, and upstream development. Um, and um, so, so in order to understand this, and again, you know, as you could have multiple scenarios in the future, uh, not only on land use changes or demographics or development, you also have climate, and, and at this time, of course, uh, uh, there is quite a bit of uncertainty about the climate. Uh, there are a lot of models, and, and of course, since you have a lot of models, the best thing is to run the scenarios with all multiple models to understand uh, what could happen to uh, the water in the rear, in the, in the Mara. And uh, here, for example, we have, uh, uh, this is the climate uh, 2028, this is today's, annual average precipitation and the temperature and climate model said that all of all of all of them agree that the temperature is going to be higher we know that that uh, that's for now that's that's uh, has been the trend and is 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 
there is more certainty about that. The temperature is going to go up. At the same time, for water, some models show less water, some more show more water. And as you know, everybody is seeing more. Uh, although they, when they see more water, what we're seeing is more uh, storm events, uh, uh, um, and at the same time, longer periods of drought. Uh, so in 2038, the temperature goes even hot, higher, and, and as, as you can see, this is the, the scenario for this is the today's condition, the, the blue dot here, but we're going to have temperature again going even further up. And and then you have some uh, uh, some models show less precipitation in the average. Some models want to show more precipitation. So with that, um, with that you can run some scenarios considering five, ten, twenty years at a time horizon. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, it, it gets more uncertain as as we go um, um, further down the road. Um, so I think important, an important re re recommendation is when, when, when the water location plan sees uh, what could happen in the future, um, it would be important to uh, make sure that uh, uh, you know our over allocate water uh, for big, big uh, development programs like a big irrigation program. If you don't take into account what could happen in ten years or so on, um, so these are scenarios. Uh, Pretty much give some guide of of what's coming into the future, and and of course uh, everybody knows that um, those climate models will get more precise as we go along. So that's what we always uh, advise to to better um, to to update the WAP, you know, as as more information is available. So this is an example of how you read that. Again, part of the analyzing multi and we are in the big data, a lot of data is analyzed, a lot of modeling runs are done. So it was important to create some visualization uh, uh, technique. This is an example. There are many conditions, many, um, many uh, scenarios that were run, but I'm just gonna show a few things here in this slide. I'm gonna try to explain this slide. Um, but, uh, and then some visualization techniques uh, were used. Uh, in this case, if you see in the lower left and the upper left, uh, it was selected for the climate scenarios from 2041 to 2050. And um, let's concentrate, these are three sub basins, but let's concentrate on this one. The baseline uh, pretty much was uh, uh, what the numbers chose here are the percentage of years that will have a period of three weeks or more months that the Mara River is in the reserve. So you remember that reserve value, uh, uh, that reserve that we were setting as, as, as something that we want to keep there and not touch um, for a water allocation. Well, there are these numbers chose by 2041 to in 2020 in 2041 to 2050 that um a percentage of of, of the of the months uh, percent of the years in that period that you'll see um, um three you, you'll see a period of three or more months in the reserve you know so if we read this number here um uh, going here 13 percent for this climate scenario and for this uh condition it says what it means 13 percent is that 30 percent of the years in that means one, one year or two years in in the decade of 2040 to 2050 will have a period of two or more months that the matter is in the reserve so those are scenarios so 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 here one one scenario that was modeled here this is this is a baseline this is one where the reserve is important means that we don't let the reserve uh, take 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 water from the reserve but it's pretty much the same but here, if we we have a development, uh, this this column represents a development scenario where a big, um, uh, a big uh, ag agricultural uh, irrigation program was enabled in in Kenya and in the upper watershed, and and let's see the effects. The effects of that was that the number of of as as the as the cells get rarer, more red. 
that means that the percentage of years that will have uh, three or more months in the reserve will increase. And and again, you know, this is a way of visualization of running multiple scenarios. And this in this case, this column represents an event of upstream development of a major irrigation project in 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 Kenya. So that was kind of that causes the percentages to increase. That means that more more years uh, presented uh, uh, periods where two or more months uh, in the river were in the reserve. So that's kind of the the way. And, and it, of course, this is some scenarios. This is some watersheds, uh, multiple scenarios, uh, multiple watersheds were run, um, uh, considering various scenarios. And those are uh, they were uh, chaired with the stakeholders and and um, and that. That helps them look at the planning process into the future, you know. And again, you know, I mean, uh, it, this this look a little bit further down the road, but uh, there were opportunities to do this for the next five years, uh, the next ten years, and the next twenty years. Here on the left side, you could actually in the in the visualization tool you can click whatever decade you want to analyze and look at that. So so this become very helpful in discussions with stakeholders and. How you account this in your planning process. So um, I had two more slides uh, quickly here, um, um, and then I will open for questions. So, so, um, uh, so again, I guess the guidance from all these is that uh, uh, there are a range of climates that could happen, and and then it would be important to to consider those in in a location uh, in the location process. Uh, um as we saw there are some scenarios of climate that uh, that could cause pulse a problem into the matter into the future um again you know permits should take into account that uh and, and of course for this case we were looking something way down the road i think there are within the web uh, we have other scenarios more closer to uh, to the next five to ten years uh where uh, that could be important for um, the the uh, water agencies in charge of permitting to take into consideration in case you know a new big program is developed. You know, usually a small permit is fine, but when you get into a, a large irrigation program, then they need to to look into that. Is it possible that that program uh, could have enough water uh, from the Mara based on all those scenarios and based on the location that is of course some some water should have uh, more water than other ones so so that's something that it needs to be a uh, factor in in the allocation process so so important next steps here for for the WAP as, as I mentioned to you the WAP is is, uh, is being finalized uh, it's just um, ready to be presented for final approval but it was in endorsed by the stakeholders um, an important part would be in the implementation is the monitoring and evaluation important to monitor flows in the river uh, to see if they are meeting the the, the different uh, monthly and a monthly basis they're meeting the the standard quant the quantities required for to understand what permitting should be done uh, compliance with with the water permit is important i mean it's important you issue a permit, but it's important to understand if the the the, the sectors that are doing water abstractions are uh, compliant with the permit. I think that's important because um, uh, if there are uh, over uh, over abstractions uh, bothering the permits, uh, that 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 could put us a stress uh, a given basin. Um, and frequent reporting of those uh, 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 monitoring is important to have a, a system where people come in a a system of frequent reporting, uh, uh, so so every basin understand uh, how the conditions are uh, in terms of uh, the work. Um, I think um, integration of the WAP in the permitting process is what we just talked about. Um, uh, abstraction databases, I think, is important. I, I think um, uh, what we what we was learned from the lower amount of abstraction service is that the the water uh, Lake Victoria Water Board, who is in charge of uh, of issuing permits and managing the water resources, uh, uh, didn't uh, fund new new 
new sources and new abstractions that were not uh, that didn't have a permit. Uh, so I think it's important to always keep uh, an update on that. And and finally, you know, the the WAP um, uh, should be considered as a living document. Um, it has to be updated every, uh, you know, initially probably won't be updated for five years. But if there is something significant that changes a new development program that needs to be factored in. And um, and I think in conclusion of all these, I think the lessons learned over the last couple of years doing this is that uh, the, the program has been able to get to this point where there is a water allocation planning that is uh, is uh, been uh, validated with stakeholders and it's ready for final signature by the Ministry of uh, Water. It's it's because the stakeholder engagement throughout the whole process. You saw my graph early. We have a stakeholder engagement from the beginning of the process and at different points on uh, at, at the, the the water allocation plan was progressing. Um, setting the guidelines uh, uh, was important, as, as as Michael mentioned. Uh, Tanzania developed their own guidelines on how how we do this, and that was I think that was important because that kind of pretty much set the rules for how we do the water allocation plan. I think Kenya also has some water allocation guidelines, so so they are. They have similarities between the two of them. Um, data quality and monitoring is essential. Of course, uh, I think something that was uh, discovered out of this is that there is a need for strengthening uh, monitoring stations uh, uh, in order for 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 the application of the WAP uh, uh, better better monitoring and transfer of information to the water agencies uh, in charge of permits are going to be important uh, for proper implementation of the WAP. And and again, finally, future scenarios uh, are important to be considered in the WAP. Again, you know, the the projection to the future, to find the future, yes, this could happen, but you 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 need to look at the next decade and see if if, if any development or any uh, uh, any development could be like a large agricultural program. Um, okay that scenario needs to be analyzed because it's not there. And so anything new that comes, I think is important to to factor into the WAP uh, to understand that there is enough um, water to, to be able to meet that demand. Um, and, and those scenarios needs to be obviously um, uh, assessed in terms of uh, the impact to that could have into water allocation. Uh, so this is what I have for you uh, today. Thank you very much. And I think we can, uh, Clara, we can open uh, the floor for more questions. Thank you, Rodolfo. Thank you very much. I, I just from my side, as a, probably as a, not a water, but a systems and governance professional, I'm very much appreciative of the fact that there is recognition of the fact that a document like the WAP is indeed has to be a living document, not just because it's based on scenarios, but because planning can and should change as circumstances changes. Uh, whether it is because of wild cards, uh, you know, like a pandemic, for instance, or um, whether it is because of just normal changes that happen in a in any given landscape. Um, so. With that, I'm looking at the at the list of participants, and nobody has raised a hand for a final question. There are no questions in the question box. Um, so I think I will then thank you for your time this morning, which is very early for you, um, for the presentation that you've given us, for your time, for your colleagues from the Mara uh, work who have participated and. I don't know if maybe they would like to add something um, in terms of comments based on their work experience in the Mara Basin. Annette or Annette or Gordon. Gordon, yeah. He's still there. Gordon is still there. Annette is still there. Uh, Annette, I think uh, she will have to dial in. So let me give her. Okay, but Gordon, uh, you. Yeah, Gordon. I, I, just a quick um, comment on uncertainty because I um, my experience in the Mara was the uh, the distinction between the uncertainty say around the pandemic or climate change which of course we want to incorporate in the scenarios versus the deep uncertainty also in terms of the a lack of data a lack of data around 
groundwater availability, water quality, um, no stream gauges on the three major tributaries. So I think part of part of the scenario is is trying to work with both types of uncertainties. I yeah. hope that's helpful input. Yeah, yeah, and to that end, you know, this is one of the important recommendations, and this is what um, we hope that the WAP will be updated as uh, as uh, more precise data is uh, is uh, is available. I think one of the principles that uh, for the WAP guidelines. Uh, from Tanzania was that although if recognizable that there is some data gaps that that shouldn't stop by putting together a, 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 a WAP um, that would serve as a guideline to, to the basin boards to do a water allocation. So, so that's kind of an important thing. They, so so, yeah. so data, as much as data could be generated, there is a still uh, you know data data gaps and that that definitely will inform uh, an update and improvement of the WAP. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Gordon, thank you very much. This is Gordon Mumbo. I think Rodolfo has covered it quite well. I just want to add that uh, in the process we learned a lot from stakeholders and the stakeholders engagement was critical. Some historical background that were provided by the stakeholders really helped us in covering some of the data gaps uh, in the basin. So anybody considering doing uh, water location planning should take stakeholders engagement as a critical step in the process. That's all I can add. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Gordon. I think that's very true. Anybody doing any work in you know, in terms of planning for local resources allocation, water or other resources, stakeholder engagement is critical precisely for that historical local knowledge that uh, may not be recorded, but is definitely present and very much alive. Rodolfo? No, I think that's, that's it. I think that's, that's it for me. And uh, and I think um, it will be, we have a, Tanzania will enter a, a challenging period where uh, it comes with the implementation of the WAP and, and of course, uh, the next steps to, uh, to to have conversations with uh, Kenya for a transboundary WAP and, and that the, the institutional uh, um, aspects are already in place. There is a joint committee uh, to be the, between Tanzania and Kenya that will be discussing uh, potential um, uh, WAP, uh, uh, WAP agreements for, for, for the transboundary watershed. Yeah, thank you. That's very important because, of course, we all know that, especially in in our region and in, and in Africa in general, water resources are often transboundary. So, what happens mm -hmm. in one country is totally independent from what happens in in neighboring countries. And we have that in Southern Africa as well. So, we're grappling with the same questions on how do we take the work that one does locally um, at a transboundary level with um, engagement, not just from the local people, but also from engagement with with government and big decision makers. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Rodolfo, yeah. for a beautiful presentation and for have um, given us, uh, Eva Nilton um, would like to have one last um, question. Yes, I'm going to unmute you now, Eva Nilton. Yep. Yes, yeah, hi. Uh, hello again. Hi. hi. Um, uh, 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 Rodolfo just said something that caught up my mind for something that uh, I was uh, wondering to ask. Um, you know, I am an environmental engineer and I know how hard it is to work with um, the political class and try to work with stakeholders and make them understand the figures and the facts, scientific facts that we gathered and how to make them understand things. And there was something that I didn't really understand through his explanation, is it because uh, Rodolfo's presentation was about the Tanzania side of the river. And for what I could understand is the lower part of the river. And uh, the, the higher part of the river is in Kenya, right? Correct. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and while you were talking about the inputs for the, um, the WAP, uh, one of them uh, in the, the part of the uncertainty was the uses made in, on upstream. 
And uh, mm -hmm. in this model uh, specifically, um, have you already determined and found out what has been done or what is going to be um, uh, used, what, what is going to be done upstream in Kenya? Or um, you do like separate um, assessments on each catchment and then uh, both countries talk about it and find ways uh, to, to manage it. Or you do, you're just do, you just did the Tanzania part first, and then you will do the the Kenya part first. I, I really, I really didn't quite get that. Yeah, good question. Uh, good question. And yes, the the uh, Kenya ready for first of all the scenario, the model, everything is a watershed, so you have to, uh, you have to have the whole watershed, Kenya and Tanzania. Yeah, it's just that. For for purposes of the water location plan, uh, it was done for Tanzania mm -hmm. following the guidelines of Tanzania, and that was kind of the effort that that has that. Now Kenya has a draft water location plan too, based on similar studies. It's just that okay. uh, we are supporting now more directly the water for Tanzania because that was not there. Yeah. So so okay. but Kenya so first still had a, yeah so so the idea the idea here is that uh, when Kenya formalize also because they need they need to validate the water allocation plan and Tanzania then uh, we are helping the two countries create a framework by which they will discuss the establishing a water allocation plan that is 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 uh, is um, uh, is transboundary now. If you think about it, some of course some some sub basins that are, doesn't depend on on what's coming from upstream, because there are uh, there are some of the sub basins are flows that generate the within Tanzania, yeah. But the main the main stem of the Mara, the main river, obviously has has a uh, has a, a big contribution of the water comes from Kenya, and that that needs to that 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 agreement in terms of of, of how much flows Tanzania want to make sure that they, they preserve, that has to be negotiated between Kenya and Tanzania. You know, they say, okay, our water allocation says that for this watershed, which is the at the border between Kenya and Tanzania, we need at least these flows. Then you need to talk to to Kenya. I mean, this is our requirement based on our analysis. Uh, what is your analysis? And then they'll they'll need to work together on that. Okay, so here comes the, the critical point for my question is um, uh, for the, the, the assessment in Tanzania, the inflow was calculated based on scenarios that would come from Kenya or did you use actual uh, figures from the Kenyan assessment? So, so, so for the water availability is... is uh... Is 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 a rainfall runoff model, so it's 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 not it's not any difference. It's the same model that was used for the entire basin. Okay, in terms of where water coming. Now for the scenarios, uh -huh. yes, there there for a scenario when you do a scenarios planning, there was one scenario that looked into population growth in Kenya, and there was one scenario that looked at uh, uh, stream uh, development in terms of more agriculture. But those were not uh -huh. those were scenarios that were thought to be possible, but I think at the end of the day, when they when they look at scenarios for the transboundary web, the two countries need to sit together and understand better what possible scenarios they're going to have into the future in terms of development in Kenya. You know, that's kind of a that's going to be important part of the conversation. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you very much. That was okay. all. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you. And Elton, also don't forget that in our in the Southern African region specifically, we do have already governance institutions that have set been set specifically to handle the transboundary um, issue within within water water management. So these are the river based organizations. So if you're looking for examples of what happens in our region, um, I'm sure those could be of um, of use to you in terms of um, looking at stakeholder engagement at at the country level, at the national government level. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I, I raised. Sorry, I just, I saw a raised hand, and now it's gone. So maybe it was just a a, 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 a 
false alarm. We have one minute. And we have one minute so. yes. Okay, so let's say goodbye to everybody. And just to remind you that the seminar that was going to be happening last week with um, um, IBM Research Africa is now scheduled for next week and we will confirm the title and the speaker as soon as possible hopefully within this this week already so just uh, stay tuned and stay registered in the series so that you can attend next week as well and you'll receive a reminder so thank you again rodolfo for your time and for the time of all the colleagues in the mara project and um we'll see you again next week thank you okay thank you bye-bye Bye-bye.